Welcome to The Book Podcast, where we discuss books about the book, the Bible, with your hosts, Scott Moffitt, Gabriel Penfield, and Gary Karwaski. We go as deep as we can go, look as hard as we can look, but we only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. We only scratch the surface of the meaning of the book. Apparently, there's a terrible conflagration going on between the nation of Israel and Gaza. It causes many of us to wonder what exactly is the role of the nation of Israel in God's prophetic timetable. Does Israel have a future or does it not? Does Israel appear in the Bible as a nation that promises are made to it or have those been abrogated? Has Israel been replaced by the church? Those who hold to covenantalism see no role for the nation of Israel in the future because that was all completed in the past. The church is God's focus now. However, premillennial dispensationalists would say, hold on just a moment there. (laughs) Israel, as God's chosen nation, has many unfulfilled promises that are still relevant to her and to us. Has God forsaken Israel? We examine that issue today in our 43rd podcast with our guest, Dr. Larry Pettigrew of Shepherd's Theological Seminary. Is it Shepherd or Shepherds? It is uh, Shepherd's as in, in, in the sense of pastors, Shepherd's okay. Theological Seminary. We're connected, though, with the church, which is sh- the Shepherd's Church, and that's apostrophe yes. And that's in beautiful Cary, North Carolina. Is that where you're located? It is, yeah. This this is a lovely place, lovely place, yeah. So the book Forsaking Israel, right there. Yep. Yeah, we got it. There it is. Is written by the staff, the faculty of Shepherd Seminary, and I believe, um, uh, Larry, you wrote most of it. I, think I wrote most of it and edited yeah. it. Yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And in your life, you've been a a pastor, a um, a teacher, a seminary professor, but you've held almost all other positions that you could within the church and the educational system that supports it. So our topic today is supersessionism, or has the church replaced Israel as covenantalism teaches? Larry's well equipped to discuss this subject after 50 years as a professor and holding degrees from Bob Jones, Central Baptist Seminary, and Dallas Theological Seminary. He is a proud and loud premillennial dispensationalist. Whatever that the, is. <laughs> we'll figure that out. The, welcome to the book. Now, if you're watching us, please don't forget to subscribe, to like our podcast, and to hit the notification bell. That will help us get this out to more people. So it's important that uh, you do those things, if you would, please. I am joined once again by my friend, retired pastor, Gary Karwaski, and my grandson, Gabriel Penfield, who is a student at Dallas Seminary. Sorry about that, Larry. Let's begin by my first uh, asking <laughs> you this question. Why was this book a necessity to be written? Has it become yeah, more that, important? That, you know, I think there are kind of two reasons. I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I think it. I think there are a couple of reasons that we had to write this book. One of them was that, uh, you, you know, this is just a personal spiritual thing. If you don't mind my saying so, we had, um, we we want people all of us to glorify God, and we want people to know God better. And if they, they will know God better if they know who God is and what he, what he does for us. And if we could emphasize for people the covenant faithfulness of God, we think we would do a good thing for them spiritually and otherwise. So on that level, that's uh, one of the reasons why we write this book, and I imagine that's why you do all of your work as well. And then the other level is because... Uh, 
Yeah, it, it's we're, we're concerned for the younger generation, like Gabe. Uh, so many of uh, the younger pastors and uh, seminary students, maybe young college students as well, have, uh, you know, they've gone through this uh, kind of a revival of the Reformed theology. And uh, it is, you know, this is not something especially brand new. I think it's uh, one of my friends uh, has written some works on it and traces all the way back to the 30s with, in Scotland someplace. But there's been kind of a revival of that. And, uh, you know, from our seminary perspective, that's not all bad. Uh, if you change and begin to believe in uh, unconditional election and efficacious grace, well, you know, for exegetical reasons, then we're excited about that. But uh, there's some dangers that has occurred, I think, especially with the younger generation. And one of them is there's a to make a change for biblicism is even now being uh, discouraged to be used. I've seen some recent articles against biblicism. Come on, you know, <laughs> uh, I was taught from my very earliest days in seminary. We're biblicists. That's who we are. And I've had to give up some of my terms over the years to describe myself. But this is one, one I'm not giving up. <laughs> I am a, a, a biblicist. So I, I think that's a concern. You know, when you make this change, are you making it for exegetical reasons? Okay. But if you're making it just for systematic, uh, dogmatic kind of reasons, well, then I think that's the wrong way to go. And then uh, part of that is they seem to have thrown the uh, these new adherents to, to uh, reform theology, has thrown out the eschatological views that they had been taught earlier on, seem to think that if you have if you have to accept, if you accept some Calvinism, serious Calvinism, well, then you also have to accept Reformed eschatology. And uh, we're saying just like what you said, wait a minute, that's uh, that's not necessary. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, because dispensational theology is uh, much better, more biblical than any other of the theologies. So we wrote the book. Mm. Do you think the book is now more important because of what's going on in Israel with the war with Hamas? I think it is. Um, I think what's going on in Israel, with you, you would, men would have as good an idea as I do, but uh, I think it's kind of a foreshadow of what might happen when we get to the end of the tribulation period, long time away. I don't think they're gonna, Israel's going to lose this at this point because they've got so much support from the uh, United States and uh, other countries like that. But if you would take the rapture and take all the Christians out and uh, give us a uh, few more years, there could be total disregard of Israel. And when, when I read Zechariah 12, 13, and 14, mm. uh, when the Lord comes back and deals with the problems, it's because there was nobody else to help. And that's, that's going to be a real crucial crisis time at that time right now though there's other people to help i think i think israel will be okay but yeah that's a concern that the whole idea of anti-judaism and anti-semitism is a concern mm -hmm. yeah all right before we start um really getting into it let's define some terms the idea of the church superseding israel yeah what does that word mean supersede and how do you you define it. How do other people define it? Like, what's the definition of that word? Yeah, it's it's a kind of a theological word for replacement theology. That's the way I look at it. And so, supersessionism means that the church has permanently replaced Israel as God's instrument in His plan. So, mm -hmm. yeah, the church is. You know, we can we can imagine that there's a temporary replacement of his of Israel but permanently replaced now that's not what scripture teaches so that's to me is supersessionism replacement theology yeah good okay. yeah let's identify the one I, I thought about earlier um define dispensational premillennialism because that's the construct against really covenant theology right yeah dispensational premillennialism is based on 
Okay. I, I won't go into all the details of what it's based on, but dispensational premillennialism is uh, a dispensational system based upon premillennialism that supports the future of Israel. There you go. <laughs> it is. Um, so let's contrast that then with covenant theology. How does that uh, forsake? How does covenant theology forsake Israel? Covenant theology has uh, accepted supersessionism from the beginning of it <clears throat> in the late Reformation, and has uh, uh, codified it in their covenants. Cut codified supersessionism in their covenant so that Israel has no future. So mm. that's based upon the, the whole idea of supersessionism again, which uh, covenant theology is based on. Yeah. How much should we trust the early church fathers since the doctrine of um, Israel and many of the other doctrines had not been fully fleshed out over time? So how much Freedance, should we get to those who reject um, this whole idea of premillennial dispensationalism? Though some embraced it at first, and then they turned around and rejected it later on. And then you have Augustine, and you have Zwingling, and you have others that come up and uh, format, give us the format or the paradigm of covenantalism. So how much should we look back to them instead of just using present-day writers that get the basics correct? Yeah, as far as the church fathers go, um, the uh, the first chapter here is the curious case of the church fathers in Israel. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, it, I think it was a, a puzzling situation in the early days of transition because at first the Jewish, the church was so Jewish in Acts chapter 2, and then we add in the Samaritans and then the Gentiles in Acts 10 and 11. So, there is a lot of confusion from this was a Gentile problem to begin with. And so the Jews uh, were concerned about it and kind of irritated about it just a little bit. And we have Acts 15 that gives us the Jerusalem Council. that sorts out some of those kind of things. But uh, the majority were Jews. But then as time goes along, you know, we get into the fact that the church fathers by this time have become our, gen our Gentiles for the most part, maybe maybe one, uh, Melito of Sardis was a Jew, but most of them are Gentiles. So whereas before it was Jew criticizing apostate Jew, now it's the Gentiles who are criticizing the Jewish world. And uh, more and more, of course, are Gentiles by that time. Uh, so, you know, they're writing treatises against the Jews. Hippolytus writes the one... Uh, the, exp the expository treatise against the Jews, Justin Martyr, Dialogue with Trifle. And in those books, then they begin to talk about the fact that the church is now Israel. So they were premillennialists, these, these early ones, but they still didn't have any real belief that Israel was going to be reunited. Uh, and premillennialists, there are two or three fathers very early, I don't know whether they may have been dispensational premillennialists or not, but as time goes along, it's pretty apparent that uh, they were not see seeing a future for Israel at that time. Yeah. And you're not going to see a lot of arguments against that is the early church fathers didn't use the word pre premillennialism to right. define their terms, right? They explained what they thought the Bible said. Yeah. And we would define it as premill looking at it from now, but they don't use the exact words. Um, a lot of doctrines like that. Um, the argument against the word of God being inerrant, they don't use the word inerrant, but they believe that if you look at it. Yeah. Um, going up to the Reformation um, with Martin Luther, um, he his writings very much, um, he, had, he, had, he had some great stuff he taught, um, huge impact on the church today, but he also taught, quite a bit of anti-Semitism. Um, his book, The Jews and Their Lies. Yeah. What Can you explain a little bit about that? How has that fed into anti-Semitism today? Yeah. So, so, you know, there are other reasons why the church fathers, uh, they didn't know what to do with the Old Testament, a number of things like that. It was a, an apologetic solution because mm -hmm. now they could say that the church is the oldest of all religions. 
uh, older even than Israel, even, you know, so there's a lot of things going on in the church fathers that caused them to go that direction. Then you have yep. Augustine, who we might mm -hmm. want to say a little more about. I didn't write that yep. chapter, but yeah. And then so when we get to the Reformation, then you've got this, uh, you've got two things that are pretty obviously developing. We call this chapter the Israel and the Dark Side of the Reformation. And one of them is uh, anti-Semitism, and that's with Martin Luther and the book that you mentioned there on the Jews and their lies. Apparently, Luther had a uh, was kind of two-staged in this in his early Lutheran days, his early days as a reformer. Mm -hmm. he, um, he actually uh, thought that maybe the Jews would join him in the Reformation when they didn't. And uh, the Luther, Lutheran scholars tell us that then he changed his mind entirely. And so he wrote that book. It's just full of sarcasm, mean language. He recommended that you burn down synagogues and wow. burn down the Jewish people's houses. Uh, you forbid them to have safe conduct on the highways. Uh, you know, a number of things, things like that. So it was very, very critical. Synagogues were dens of uh, devils. Yeah. And build them with Christian charity. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. So now, you know, the, the modern Lutherans have officially apologized for that. Obviously, they had to, and it was the right thing to do. But I think the, the Reformation Lutherans were anti-Semitic. I think we can say that. I mean, that to me is anti-Semitic, what Luther yeah. was saying in that book. Um, and it was based, again, on supersessionism. Yeah. Can we talk about um, how they did that? They this the spiritualization of the old testament or the reading of the new testament into the old testament how do those two things uh, become factors in let's say the title of the book forsaking israel yeah yeah well i think it goes back to the fathers again and um the fathers uh didn't know, didn't know what to do with the old testament they had um they had on the one side, you had Marcionites who had uh, denied uh, the Old Testament entirely. And then you had the Jews who had, many of them had denied the, the New Testament entirely. So the fathers, they walked down kind of the middle. They believed the, the Old Testament was inspired of God. It was the word of God. But at the same time, they believed that you had to update the Old Testament. The Old Testament was kind of a first draft. And uh, mm -hmm. the church is the second draft, so to speak. You know, the old covenant's the first draft, new covenant's the second draft. And so they kind of decided that you have to go back and read the church into the Old Testament promises, especially. So if you get a promise for Israel that they're going to be glorified by God and have a wonderful future and all kinds of wealth and all those kind of things, then you, you can uh, apply that to the church. So that's why you have the church state, you know, state church, and it became wealthy. And that sort of is the fulfillment of the promises that were made to Israel in the Old Testament. So it was a process of not knowing what to do with the Old Testament and coming up with the wrong reason. So would Augustine be an example of that? Yes. And he was a giant in oh, yeah. Christendom and is still today his theological works impact us all the way down to today, including the yeah. city of God. And uh, it was out of his writings that amillennialism really developed. Now, mm -hmm. if, if I understand it right, uh, a lot of these early church fathers like Augustine and Luther, they weren't really espousing a fully developed form of covenantalism or reform right. thought. But yeah. Augustine did develop the idea of amillennialism denying what is obvious in Revelation 20, where the 1,000-year uh, millennium right. is uh, spoken of six times, I believe. How, yeah. how, how did they do that? How did, how did they miss that? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I haven't read it for a while, but mm -hmm. Augustine's uh, exposition of Revelation 20 is painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, what in the world is going on here? You know, it's a total denial of what the text says. Uh, so again, what this, what you, if you got supersessionism, then this, you got to figure out how to go from the um, future of Israel to the future of the church. Church is right now. Uh, the kingdom is right now. That's all what 
uh, Gessen mm -hmm. came up with. It was interesting that Dave Burgraff wrote that chapter, and Dave's a graduate of, of Dallas. In fact, all of us are graduates of Dallas. Right. But um, he, was a, he did some good things in the Fathers in his doctoral program. So he wrote that chapter on Augustine, and he could explain it better than I can, for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, they had to somehow figure out how to, how to get the kingdom to be all ready rather than not yet. Mm -hmm. so the title of that chapter, yeah. Would it, would it be fair to say there was a spirit of anti-Semitism within the Old Testament fathers? And if so, where did that come from? Um, like Augustine, he was uh, anti-Semitic at times. Yeah. I, I'm not sure. You know, you, and some of the discussions that uh, the fathers have with the Jews they're polite and kind to them, you know, and it's not as though they're just blasting away, but they're trying to, so I, th I think some of these dialogues are made up, but they're trying to convince them that the church has replaced Israel basically at that time. So I don't know if anti-Semite, but anti-Jewish, anti-Judaism would be a good description, maybe. Mm -hmm. wow. Yep. And I think... Could you, yeah, I guess we're trying to define like the difference. I kind of see like you have anti-Semitism, which is more of a hatred of the Jewish people. You have yeah. anti-Zionism, which is like, you, an anti-Zionist might still in some way not hatred, but they don't want him in the land. But then you put, probably bring up anti-Jewish. Um, can Do you have any thoughts on like the differences between those definitions? Can somebody believe that Israel is replaced, but still love the Jewish people? Like... Yeah, yes, I think so. I mean, okay. I think you could still love the Jewish people, but you would have to get your mind straight, you know. Yeah. It, it doesn't come from the churches necessarily, the, the mainline churches today. So you'd have to get your head straight on that. But uh, there are, I think, Protestants, uh, let's just say Protestants that uh, give money to help the, the Jewish people. I see charity things coming through my mail, and it's uh, Jews and and Gentiles, but it's Christians and Jews working to, you know, to support the poor Jews and things like that. So I, I think that's possible and that some could be there. Theologically, they would say, you know, there's no future for Israel, but socially they would say, but yeah, but we need to, you know, be kind to the Jews. So, yeah. So there's yeah. a, there's a middle ground to be found there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if we take move back a little further on in church history, uh, past uh, Augustine, past uh, Luther, past Calvin, we have a series of, uh, I guess we could call them the scholastics. And they kind of focused on the, on the view of the election and predestination of the individual, focused on God's choice there of you as an individual person. God's sovereign election, though, of Israel was ignored. Why couldn't they see that? If they're talking about us as being individually elected, why couldn't they not see Israel as God's elect nation? Yeah, you would think so, wouldn't you? Uh, on the one hand, I, I I think there was a time pressure on on the, the reformers and the second generation reformers. They had to they had to defend uh, what the what the first generation of covenant theologians had put together. They had to defend that against um, Lutheranism and against Roman Catholicism. So they were focusing in on just the soteriology, uh, getting that right, and then making it sound reasonable. And, you know, they have this is when infra, infra lapsarianism and super lapsarian mm -hmm. terms come around. So you got to put it all together logically and make it fit so it could be a defense. But they were still supersessionist, and uh, and by that time even had gone in, in a step forward towards uh, systematic covenant theology as well. But uh, they were, you know, they were still supersessionist, so that didn't seem to bother them. Mm -hmm. That the same Greek words for the election of Israel uh, are used for the election of us. So if we're elect and secure and all that. Why wouldn't Israel be elect and secure? But well, they didn't seem to get there. So no, they didn't. And it doesn't make it, it makes no sense to me because if God rejected Israel, who was elect, 
Why can't he do that to us as well? Yeah, Where's absolutely. Our security. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah, it's a it's an important lesson to realize God's covenant faithfulness not only to us but also to Israel at the same time. But Gary, Gary the church is doing so well. I mean, Israel failed, but I mean, the church is just like thriving go. and going. <laughs> <laughs> is that sarcasm, Gabe? A little bit. No, <laughs> just a little bit. Gary mentioned the scholastics. Who who are they? Who yeah, are they? Yeah, scholastics. Uh, scholastic just means school for the most part. So these are people that were working in the academia reform seminaries and graduate schools and all that th kind of thing, whatever they had at that time. And uh, so and they were dedicated to the idea of this um, logical presentation that would be convincing to the, you know, to the Europeans, especially, and to Americans when, when the time they came along, that uh, they this was a better um, system than uh, than Lutheranism or Roman Catholicism. So they're trying to arrange all of this in a wonderful, logical, fashionable way. Fashionable way. So scholasticism is just academic, but it's known as also the age of uh, orthodoxy. And so this is when a lot of the... the what deep time period is this? Yeah, same time going on. And, and there are some good works that we appreciate that were done by the scholastics, uh, uh, who was a keen stat who did a he was a Lutheran did a work on inerrancy and we probably have heard of Francis Turretin who did a good work on inerrancy so there were some good things going on in that way but we wouldn't be mad about you know but but some of it is uh, got beyond biblicism at that time yeah yeah so let's jump a little bit into um, similar time period. Um, covenantalism, right? You see kind of the development of that during that time. Yeah. Can you define what covenantalism generally is? Uh, maybe touch on the covenants and then how that plays into um, replacement theology? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's really a, a key, key question and a key section mm -hmm. of what I try to do there in the book. Um, covenant theology is basically a theology that's based upon three theological covenants, covenant of, well, it starts with the covenant of grace, and then we add the covenant of works, and then later we get the covenant of redemption. Mm -hmm. So that becomes kind of the, the framework for all of all of uh, Reformed theology as it develops into covenant theology. It was kind of a step-by-step -step process that took place. Uh, I think the covenant of grace, was it was not called that, but I think probably... Uh, earlier people, even Augustine, would have had some sort of a unifying covenant, which you, whatever you wanted to call it. But uh, when we get then into the Reformation period, that begins to develop, first of all, with the covenant of grace into a really, uh, really important foundational aspect of, um, of what theology is all about, what the Word of God is all about. I don't know how much you want me to go into the history, but you know, you start with uh, Zwingli for sure, and Zwingli's in this battle. Uh, Zwingli's very early. He's in this a few years after Luther, so he's fighting a battle in Zurich, Switzerland, and he uh, is fighting against not only the Roman Catholics, but he first of all he has this uh, kind of a dream team, Grebel and Mance and and Zwingli himself. But then the Anabat these people who become Anabaptists. They disagree with Zwingli. You're not supposed to be doing a state church uh, reformation. You're supposed to be doing an individual. We can just have our separatist churches. Don't have to be connected with the government. And we believe in believers' baptism. Well, this is too much for Zwingli. And so, you know, you get into a big, he began to persecute them eventually. But in order for Zwingli then to, de you know, to defend what he was saying there, against the Anabaptists, he had to show that there was one covenant that covered the whole Bible. And that one covenant was essentially the covenant of grace. Mm -hmm. But what you can do with, uh, you know, with the covenant of grace, with one covenant, is you then turn the sacraments, okay, you turn circumcision into infant baptism, you turn the Passover into uh, the Lord's Supper, 
So you, you have this one covenant that's going to cover the whole, mm -hmm. the whole Bible. Zwingli wouldn't even admit that the new covenant was different from the old covenant. He said Paul oh, uses it as a, a, what, a misuse of language or something like that. He's, he's just using it because some other people have used it that, no, there's only one covenant. And uh, that ties the church and the state together. Wow. And uh, therefore, he, yeah. he went in that direction. Of course, he died soon after that in, in, uh, in the war with Roman Catholics. But um, then the next step in that is his successor, who is, um, got his name, uh, uh, Heinrich Bullinger. Heinrich Bullinger, and he writes this really important book entitled The One and Eternal Testament or Covenant of God. And he just basically takes what Zwingli said and kind of kind of makes it a little nicer sounding and deals with some of the problems. And, uh, and he becomes really important. People read his book and the Reformed world, uh, his impact all over the Reformed world is pretty great at that time. So that was... That's Bullinger. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in this midst, we have John Calvin. And it's hard to know what to do with John Calvin. I mm -hmm. point that out in the book, whether he is really a covenant theologian or or not. And even the Calvin scholars don't know for sure. You get four different views. One is he wasn't a covenant theologian at all. And you got one, oh, he's a little bit, sort of incipient covenant theology. Then some believe he was full-blown covenant theologian, and some say he was an against covenant theology. So, you know, you got different views on what Calvin really believed. But uh, he was important, of course, because he, he did emphasize the one covenant, circumcision and his infant baptism and so forth. So he was very important in this. And he become, because he's such an important theologian, he uh, has an impact in systematizing the, the Reformation theology during that time. So that was a big thing as well. But yeah. uh, Calvin, I, I think he would say he was an incipient covenant theologian. That is, what, what he believed uh, was agreeable with what, <clears throat> what the later covenant theologians came up with. So that's where I put him someplace. I don't think he's a full-blown yeah. covenant theologian, but he's... He's a supersessionist, and he believes in the state church and all those kind of things that will be a part of uh, supersessionist theology the rest of their existence, I guess. And Zacharias Ursinus, nobody's ever heard of him. Well, there is a Ursinus College in Pennsylvania, I think it is, someplace. But I never heard of it. Yeah. <clears throat> but he's the, he's the one who probably develops the covenant of works. Now, I think there's more than one are doing that during that time. The covenant of works is the covenant that God, this is a supposed covenant that God made with Adam at creation, which would promise to him that if he would, um, if he would follow God, be do good works, do what God told him to do, he'd go to heaven. But if he didn't, he would be go to hell. So there's some sort of a covenant that was in there someplace, according to them. And uh, and these reformers began to come up with that idea, the reformed theologians, and develop it. And Zechariah Ursinus, I think he's kind of the first person to, to publish it, to put it out in uh, a book. Uh, they, he didn't call it a covenant of works. He called it the covenant of nature, covenant of creation. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But before long, they were calling it the, a covenant of works. So now I think when you get there with Ursinus and the other reformers by 1880, I'm sorry, 1580 or 1590, then you have covenant theology because you got the two covenants working together. It's not just one covenant, but you got the two covenants working together. And, it, from, and you, they just kind of run from there, run from that point and develop the whole system at that time. One of the amazing things to me that I didn't know as, before I studied this <clears throat> is that the covenant theologians believe that the covenant of works continued to exist after the fall. Mm -hmm. And it goes through abrogations and modifications. Eventually, I mean, basically, this becomes the Mosaic Law. But mm -hmm. 
the covenant of works is still there and it's still at the basis of their soteriology, which is really right. an idea as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I think a lot of people that might hear about the covenants, covenant theology, get mixed up and they don't understand it. Yeah. And and when we talk about the reformers, we're talking about people in the 15 to 1700s that were changing and, and leaving the Catholic Church and beginning the Protestant uh, Reformation. That's why they're reformers. But when you think of the covenants, we're talking about the covenant of works, the covenant of grace, and the covenant of redemption, but that's not covenants in the Bible. That's right. These are made up by theologians, and these are found basically either before the creation or during the creation. Can you explain that a little bit and then contrast that with the real covenants? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. In fact, if, if you were to let me redo the history of dispensationalism, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I, would, I would use, instead of dispensationalism, I would use the word biblical covenantalism because mm -hmm. we are, our system is based on the biblical covenants. Right. So I mean, then you can turn your Bible right to Abraham's covenant. Mm -hmm. You can turn to David's covenant and read about it. You know, you can read the biblical covenants. You can't turn any place in your Bible and find the covenant of grace or the covenant mm -hmm. of works or the covenant of redemption, as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, there's a big difference between biblical covenants and the theological covenants that have been proposed by the covenant theologians. Mm -hmm. Um Okay. Any, I don't those know. Those are I, found. They they say those took place in before creation, though. But uh, an agreement between God and the Son for one of them, and then an yeah. agreement between God and Adam in the garden. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Yeah. And, and that's found nowhere in Scripture. No. And but we as dispensationalists do believe in covenants. We just Absolutely. believe in the Abrahamic, the yeah. the uh, New Covenant, the, the Davidic Covenant, and so on and so forth which is completely different. I, I'm not sure most people would understand that they would kind of merge or meld those thoughts I know, together. I know that we, we have to really work at making that clear because biblical covenant, biblical covenants are a big thing in our system. You know, we're really, it's kind of the framework for what we believe. Yeah. Are let's, let me, one question, Gary, are dispensationalists reformed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy. Look out, look out. <laughs> well, I don't call myself reformed. No, I don't <laughs> I I say I'm a Calvinist. I'm willing to say that. I believe in exegetically that there are certain doctrines are that Calvinists have fought down through the years before John Calvin, for heaven's sakes, but mm -hmm. that they are true, that it's a better system than Arminianism, but at the same time, I don't think you have to be um, reformed in the, or I said this already, I guess, you have to be reformed in the full sense of the word in order to be a dispensationalist or not a dispensationalist. I mean, that's something that goes along with your theology. And uh, in my case, I'd say I was Calvinist. I, I, we take, at our seminary, we take we take uh, unconditional election seriously. We teach those those doctrines, but Earl, Earl Rodmacher said he was a biblicist, which yeah. I've heard you say yeah. several times. Oh, I love that word, and I hate the idea that they're. I know the word biblicist. It, it was uh, um, it was used for a form of neo orthodoxy back in the thirties or whatever. Right. But biblicism in the, the right sense of the word, you know, where you you take the Bible as your only rule of faith and practice, and you begin with the exegesis of Scripture, and and you go from there. That's one of the differences. Exactly. You may, may want to ask that question between us and the covenant theologians, how how it developed. And, yeah. I can yeah. say, before you go, Gary, I can say I'm reformed from the Catholic Church. <laughs> I think we can say that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, just, just an observation there. Those are theological covenants and i think the whole purpose of them was to replace the biblical covenants primarily those with israel but we got an issue here let's just bring that up a little bit um jeremiah 31 yeah the new covenant it's promised exclusively to israel yeah um yet, israel and uh, judah andrew okay there we go 
There we go. <laughs> and uh, yet believers in the church age also benefit from it. Yeah. Now, this is a conundrum that I think plays into uh, supersessionist hands. See? Oh, we told you so. What mm -hmm. is that all about? <laughs> Yeah, it's a mess. Now you guys need you need to read my book, The New Covenant Ministry of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah, help me yeah, answer that question. But to me, you know, just a, a big broad picture here. Yes, the covenant, the new covenant is for Israel and Judah, and will be fulfilled in the great revival that's going to take place at Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 tell us about. And uh, whatever happens in the tribulation before that time, so that it will all be to them and, and be finalized with them, and all the provisions of the new covenant will be finalized with Israel. But in the meantime, in God's uh, system of, of okay, in, in, in progressive revelation um, ah. mm -hmm. and the mystery form of the church in the Old Testament, but now we are learning about the the New Testament church, when we get into the New Testament, and we have the day of Pentecost. And I think that uh, believers today uh, get into the benefits of the new covenant by being in Christ. And Christ is the mediator of the new covenants to us. Uh, and in that sense, we benefit from some of the benefit, uh, blessings. But the ministry of the Holy Spirit is so, so important to us. Uh, is a part of the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. And that, that to me is a part of union with Christ, how we become a part of the blessings of the new covenant. That's being in being in Christ because he fulfilled the law, doesn't that keep us from having to um, do the works of the law today? Uh, it, we're in Christ and so that we're fulfilled. That doesn't mean we should go around breaking the law. That's... No. Uh, um, you know, timeless, but that doesn't mean that we are saved by that any longer, which is kind of what covenantalism, if you really read it, leads to or reformed thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you get into the down down into the heart and soul of covenantalism, that's where they are. But mm -hmm. you're right. Yeah, Christ fulfilled the law for us. And so we don't have mm -hmm. to fulfill it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gabe? Yeah. No, really good stuff. Um next question we have kind of moving on. Um, we're talking about like covenantalism. We're talking about dispensationalism. It's very much glasses through which you view the Bible, right? You come yeah. to very different inter interpretations. Um, if you're talking about the grace covenant, which um, covenantalists hold, there's no difference between the Old and New Testament, right? They're very similar in that they're just re the New Testament's replacing the Old Testament. Yeah. Versus if you're looking at it through more of a dispensational lens, um, you see that um see that difference, that um that difference there. Yeah. Can you define you've done it a little bit, can you define dispensational premillennialism? Like what sets that apart? What makes that different from these covenants we're talking about? Yeah. Well, okay, so Part of my dispensationalism comes right out of Charles Ryrie. <laughs> uh, there you go. For all of us, I think. So anyway, uh, what defines dispensationalism? We could probably add a few things to what Ryrie said, but one is going to be that the church is a distinct organism. Um, another is going to be that we believe in consistent Grammatic, I call it grammatical historical, so people don't get messed up on literal, but mm -hmm. grammatical historical interpretation. And especially, I would, when I teach it, I add this little sub point to that, especially the historical grammatical interpretation of the Old Testament prophets. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you know, you're going to come up with premillennialism. You can't help it. So they have to kind of avoid that. And then, Something about um, the glory of God, doxological purpose of um, God's plan. Uh, you can press that maybe down into the, you know, the development of God's kingdom. You know, Bookman adds, Bookman's chapter, Dr. Bookman's chapter, 
is fun to read. It's the whale and the elephant. It's great. And yeah, it's great. <laughs> he's he's such a character. You ought to interview him sometime. And he really knows what's going on in Israel right now. That's his specialty. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, the to him, the greatest way that God glorifies himself publicly is in the covenant faithfulness of God to Israel. And that's the public, highest form of public glorification of, of God. Now there's a lot of ways God is glorified, but publicly that's what he says is the, it's the highest form of that. So that's a, that's sticky for some people because they want to say, no, no, it's salvation of souls. Yep. Well, no, that's, yeah. that's in the, that's, that's covenant theology, you know, with right. covenants of works, grace and all that kind of stuff. Yep. But um I'm I'm okay with what Dr. Ryrie, I had him for one one I see what was he? I had him as a advisor, I guess, when I was in Dallas mm -hmm. for a while, but not not but not, not for uh, long. But. Yeah, unpack that a little bit, the concept of the whale and the elephant, those yeah. two different environments, <laughs> just so our listeners can yeah. get a better understanding of that. Yeah. He uses that kind of a metaphor. He's read it someplace else. He talks about it, but uh, but we're literalists. <laughs> <laughs> stop, stop. Yeah, which is another good point. And I make that in the book as well. That you know we believe in literal, uh, grammatical, historical interpretation, but we also believe in figures of speech, metaphors, right. and all that kind of stuff. So, Dr. Feinberg wrote a, a good chapter on that the difference between. Uh, before you answer Gary's question, isn't that really the big difference is we take the Old Testament literally, historically, and contextually, instead of allegorizing it, having to force it to fit into our predetermined paradigm, which we're laying on top of the Bible? Yeah. Isn't that really the issue? Yeah. And I think right. specifically, it's, uh, it's the, I mean, where we have the most pro problems, in my view, is with the Old Testament prophets. I mean, People, mm -hmm. okay, I, I got a, you know, I got a rant on that, on the Old Testament uh, <laughs> prophets. I've been reading them seriously for the book I'm working on right now uh, for the last four or five years. And, but nobody reads the Old Testament prophets and they don't like them. And nobody ever says, I, you know, I have a favorite verse comes out of, you know. Do doom and gloom. Nahum 4-2 or whatever, you know. I was reading this in my devotional this morning from Haggai. <laughs> hey, 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 I was just in Haggai earlier this week. And there's nothing when wrong with Haggai. Haggai. Come on. But these these guys are so good. I mean, they're, they're speaking of metaphors and similes. They're the greatest in the world. They're just such great literature, you know, and uh, it's not hard to figure them out, although there's some difficult things there. But anyway, the whale and elephant. The whale and the elephant was, these are two different beings and they cannot really fight because they're in the different worlds, different world views. They, they could thrash around a whale versus an elephant for a while, but they can't really get serious because they're, they're just not able to, you know, come get in the same frame of, frame of mind. And that's the argument is that the issue between dispensationalism and covenant theology is not just a few verses here or there, but it's a worldview, theological worldview. Completely view. different environment. Yeah. Yeah. Completely different environment. Now, again, we try to be really kind. I have a lot of respect for some of the Reformed writers and Dr. Mueller has written so many good things about the Reformation, post-Reformation, and uh, you know I have respect for those people. So we want to—I I, I want to respect them, and that's kind of a, the nature of our seminary uh, to take strong stands, but be respectful of others. And but at the same time, we're, these two groups are in opposite worldviews, theological worldviews. Yeah, I think you touched on it a little bit um, a minute ago, God's grand purpose and the difference between covenantal uh, thought and dispensational thought. They're totally um, centered on the salvific purposes of God. Everything's yeah. about God saving people. 
no right. matter when. But yeah, no. uh, according to Ryrie and according to dispensationalism, it's that God is glorifying himself through all of these purposes that we find throughout all of scripture, Old and New Testament, to uh, reach uh, the point where God is glorified in the, in the millennial kingdom and the mm -hmm. um, wrap up of everything in the eternal state. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that a little bit? What or did I already do it? <laughs> what are you asking me to speak about now? Well, the the difference in how the covenantalists see God's grand purposes in um, oh yeah 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 and you know it's a hard thing to argue against you know the glory of God in in salvation mm -hmm. uh, so so powerful we all believe in grace grace just dominates the Bible God's goodness to us and grace um, so. It's a hard thing to argue against, but I think when you, when you look at the whole picture of uh, Scripture, uh, it's all about the glory of God. And somehow, I mean, it's not that uh, it's not that covenant theologians don't believe that. I mean, that's step number one in their creeds. We believe the main purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. So mm -hmm. that's true, but it it works its way out differently in dispensationalism, which I think follows the theme of God's glory better than the way that that covenant theologians follow follow that theme. Hmm. Yeah, I see the one covenant as being man-centered. I see dispensationalism as being God-centered. Yeah, think that's, that's a good a, point. That's mm -hmm. a big difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. God didn't create us to be saved. He created us to glorify him. <laughs> um, and good. us being saved okay. is one one way of doing that. Um, let's move to talking about one further, one further thing on that, Gabe, if yeah. God's grand plan was to save humankind, he's not doing a very good job at it because there's only, <laughs> there's only a, uh, small number of people saved in every dispensation, just a remnant. Yep. Uh, just, that's just a thought I had. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Let's move to, um, the gospels talking about kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. You see that over and over and over again. And then you get to the Olivet Discourse, right? The end of Jesus is very close there to the end of his go. life. Um, he's teaching in Matthew 24 yeah. and in the other Gospels. Um, but you look at that and that speaks to a very literal kingdom, a very literal tribulation and a very literal, very literal things. Um, yeah. And people like to speak. You're talking about you don't like to use the word literal anymore. Um, interpretation. The word normal works very well for that, too, yeah. like normal. But um how do they explain? How do covenantalists, how do uh, replacement theologians explain away the literal aspect of Matthew 24 and the Olivet Discourse? Well, basically, all those systems um, are going to make it for the church and instead of for this, instead of for Israel. But I, you know, I write that chapter and I say it's it is. Uh, that the Olivet Discourse is the Lord's um, lecture on the future of Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think it is. It's the Lord's lecture on the future of Israel. So if you keep that in mind, and the questions that the disciples asked would set the context, then you come up with a, definitely some form of premillennialism at the very least, but also with the future of Israel at the same time. So and if you, if you just say, well, no, that Israel's gone and this is for the church, well, then we're going to end up in a different world. Yeah. 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 I feel like if you do explain it like that, a lot of the teaching in the Bible and the Old Testament, I don't think they want to say that, but it's kind of useless if that's the case. Yeah. Right. Jesus goes on and on and on about all these different things happening. And it's kind of like, well, <laughs> why do you need to know that if we just know that we're in the kingdom now or like, a lot of the teaching becomes null and void if you don't believe that Jesus actually had a point for teaching two full chapters yeah. on the coming kingdom. Yeah. Right. And well, what do you do with Acts chapter one, where the angels say that he's going to, the kingdom's going to come mm -hmm. when he returns it's in the exact same way. In other words, touching down on the Mount of Olives and that never happened in 70 AD or any other time. So right. how do they explain that away? Yeah. You know, 
Yeah, it's a terrible thing. The uh, and I think you're uh, Larry. You're absolutely right. I think the key to understanding that are the questions that the the two questions that the disciples ask him that lead into that. How can you avoid that? I mean, right. it's 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 amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about the future of Israel. That's what they ask about. They didn't know very much about the church at this time. I mean. There was no church. <laughs> there was no church. They'd heard Matthew 16, 18, I guess. And I guess, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, that's about it. You know, they I don't think they were thinking in terms of a church at all. They ask about the future of Israel. How could and they be answered about the future of Israel? You know, you read your Bible and it says church there, but the word is ecclesia, which means a called out group. Yeah, or an, as, an assembly, mm -hmm. and how could they would have no context to use a word church there, which right. didn't even develop until the 16th, 17th centuries from the Dutch kirk or or a, a German word kirk. So how do we how do we make that in our English Bibles church when it should be assembly or called out people? Yeah. It makes it makes people think that the church was back then. It's, oh, it's yeah. Crazy. No it's, church there, no church, but it makes no sense they, at all. So the disciples may have had a hint about it, but they didn't know very much about the church at this time. Well, you it was know, a mystery according, according to Paul. Mystery all the way up to this point, yep. Up to the day yeah. of Pentecost. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh I've got a cup, we got a couple more. I want to talk about Romans eleven. I think it could be someone else's, but um there was a resurgence of dispensational thinking with these great Bible conferences, massive oh, yeah. Bible conferences that happened oh, in yeah. the late 19th uh, century, the early uh, 20th century. Uh, you talk about in the book about the Niagara Prophecy Conference, yeah. and you actually literally read word by word, my name, by the name of William Nicholson's address that he gave in 1878 uh, at a uh, the first international prophecy conference now the yep. criticism of covenant people is this is a new thing this just <laughs> showed up here in these yep. conferences and that where our teaching has been going on forever let's talk about those conferences and how that became to be so important to current dispensational thinking yeah yeah the, you know that you know, i did my dissertation on the niagara bible conference so Oh, nice. you know, that's the, uh, deep in my heart. Nobody ever asked me anything about the Niagara Bible Conference. So there we go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is started in 1875, let's say approximately 1875, but the believers meeting, such a great story about this Irish guy, George Needham coming from Ireland. It had the revival there, but it's revival 1858, 59. And then out of that came little believers Bible studies and when he got to America, he couldn't find any of those. So he kind of got it started. And James Brooks became his friend. And James Brooks is a powerful person in the Presbyterian church at that time. And uh, he uh, eventually becomes, I think, James Brooks is the father of dispensationalism in America. So mm -hmm. from that perspective, he's a very, very important person. And uh, so and he's a president of the Niagara Baba Conference all the years that he was alive. Uh, and during that time, in 1878, the people at the Niagara Bible Conference said, we need to have a national conference, something bigger than just our summer Bible conferences where we gather here on the uh, cool areas of the Great Lakes and have a nice time together. We need to have a national one. So they have all these, they set this up <clears throat> and they have essays basically that are given there. And Bishop Nicholson who is uh, part of the Reformed Episcopal Church. Uh, he gave this lecture, and it was it was so cool because it's 70 years before 1948, before Israel becomes a nation, yeah. and he just spells out, this is what's going to happen. You know, he, he thought it was in two stages. I don't know where you guys are on that, but they come to Israel. Uh, they come back in unbelief, but then they're there. And then the revival will, will take place eventually. Agree. So, uh, so anyway, that's what he thought. And he, and he basically just read scripture, scripture after scripture, most of it Old Testament, a little bit into the New Testament, because you always got to go to Romans 9, 10, and 11 before you're done and just show what was going to happen. And the amazing thing is that's what happened, just what he mm -hmm. said. You know, my wife 
she said, boy, he must have been really smart. And I said, and then she said, oh, but he just, he just knew what scripture said there. And that's, that's the truth. You know, it was just, mm -hmm. he just knew what scripture said. So anyway, it was, it was a great conference. There was another one in 1886. Some people think these are the kind of the foundational, uh, the foundations of fundamentalist movement and premillennialism and dispensationalism. But it, the Niagara Bible Conference had a split near the end between the post-trippers and the pre-trippers. Lovely. So kind of went away that way. But at the same time, it was picked up by A.C. Gabeline and C.I. Schofield, and they had another Bible conference, Seacliff Bible conference, which they continued to proclaim that. We've all read books for Schofield and uh, mm -hmm. and Gabeline as well. You know, was so. Keswick at the same time, or was that later? Yeah, Keswick's going on in, in, in England for the most part, and some believe that the Northfield Bible Conference was more inclined to that. And uh, mm -hmm. this has been oh, D. O. Moody was at that one. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Gabe. Yeah. Where do you want to go? You have a specific 24? place. Twenty four. Well, yeah, as you're saying, Gary, Romans eleven. Um, if that's you look really at Romans, key, that whole chapter, the nine, ten, and eleven portions of scripture, and it's very hard to understand. That's that, mm -hmm. that's the issue I think a lot of people have with it is how do you understand that right being grafted in? How does Romans eleven play into replacement theology into Israel being God's chosen people. Um, but can you summarize it very quickly? Cause I know it's a long topic, yeah. but Romans 11. Yeah. It's, and our, our president, Stephen Davey, who's a pastor of the church as well. We all love him. This is a really great guy. And uh, he's uh, started the church with nothing. He was a Dallas seminary STM graduate. And now, you know, we run 4,000 or so a week in, in our services is just fantastic. And he preaches expository sermons so interestingly. And so he he did a multi-year, uh, I wasn't here for it, but a multi-year study of the Book of Romans. Mm. And so he wrote the chapter on Romans chapter 11. And uh, it's it's all about, has God cast away his people whom he foreknew? The answer is no, indeed, it's not. He has not, you know, and so it develops that whole chapter along those lines. He has illustrations. Paul does how we know he hasn't cast away his people. He has the uh, the uh, illustration of the grapevine that the Gentiles have been grafted in, the wild branch. And but you better be careful, you Gentiles, <clears throat> mm -hmm. because God can also get rid of you just as he did with that, you know, with the, the natural branch, but it always makes it, it, it always ends up with, you know, in chapter, uh, oh, let's see, in verse about uh, 24, for if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? So that's the that's the metaphor, the way it ends up with. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and he'll banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this is be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So it's just a clear, clear, how can you miss it? passage on the future of Israel. A couple of comments on that. First, um, most people I talk to over the years have been really confused about what it means all Israel will be saved. You mean God's going to go back through all time uh, and save every Israelite that's been uh, ever born and lived? Uh, mm -hmm. How is that possible? Or does that mean that in the tribulation that every Jew will turn to Christ and be saved? What does all Israel be saved? That's the first question. Second question, which I've asked a lot of Bible scholars that we've had on our program, is the point of the tribulation. For me, the point of the tribulation is God is, again, working with Israel. And I see the church or people of all the nations just getting sort of sucked along like the tail of a comet, uh, getting involved in it. But the point is reaching Israel it has nothing to do with the nations besides they're just there and part of it and rebel against God. What is your view on 
what is all Israel is going to be saved mean? And what is your view on the tribulation? Who is the focus there? And what is the point of it? Okay, we got another hour, I guess. <laughs> no, quickly, you can answer. No, quickly, that's fine. Right. Yeah, well, all Israel, as far as I'm concerned, means that at the big, at the end of tribulation, after the revival, when the kingdom actually begins, there, uh, that generation of Jews will be saved. And they have already been thinned out. If I read Zechariah properly there, there's about a third of the Jewish people that are actually converted and become um, a part of the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So it's, it's this one generation especially, and some believe that will continue on with Israel from that time on, that were believers at the end of the tribulation, they accepted the Messiah, and and also it was because yeah of course that yeah they were because the tribulation is primarily geared to bringing them back to the place where when they see their savior they will repent the family of david by himself and the family of you know and it goes on through that it's a great so one third of israel basically will get saved but that's yeah. all israel because it's all who will be faithful yeah, and trust the rest will, Christ. will be gone yeah they'll be mm -hmm. yeah they're the ones that accept messiah See, Gary, that wasn't that problematic. All right. <laughs> you, you're right. I was wrong. <laughs> Gentlemen, do we have any other questions? This was excellent. Thank you yeah. for writing the book and putting it together. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's that's great. It was a great work for all of us to do and took a long time. That was a five-year project, you know, by the time we had it all done, but and the first edition I had a little mistakes in it, so I had to do a second edition again, you know. But as it turns out, we're hoping God uses it for his glory. Yeah. Were you aiming at a lay um, uh, yeah. audience or were you aiming at seminary audience? Yeah, or scholastic? that's a good question. And um, I think, okay, we did not write it for the 12 people in the world that could understand what we're saying, right? So <laughs> that was not the purpose. Uh, but the purpose was to do something that was serious academic, but at the same time was readable and that pastors and I mean, we gave it out to all the IFCA pastors and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, pastors and uh, seminary students and lay people. I have a good friend who is a, a, an elder in the church, a lay elder, and he read it. He said, "I okay. I confess I didn't read all the footnotes, but I really enjoyed the book, you know. So I think uh, if you kind of go with that direction, and, and I just saw a review of the book recently by somebody, well, anyway, and he was very positive about it, and he seemed to say that was very readable and people could could, could understand it if they, if they you know, if you're trained, you've been a Christian for a while, and you get your mind into what the Bible says. Yeah. So why should Gabe drop out of Dallas Seminary and attend <laughs> Shepherd's Theological Seminary. <laughs> well, there might be some good reasons. And... <laughs> I, I got to talk with uh, Doug, Dr. Doug Bookman. He, I was at Word of Life and he goes up and teaches at Word of oh, Life. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I got yeah. lunch with him and I, I thought about it for a little bit, for a good while. But It's it only 167 miles away from us, Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close. Not too bad. How close is the uh, church? Um, you said the Shepherd's Church. How far is that from campus? Uh, we meet in the Shepherd's Church, the church. facilities. Okay. And, um, well, I don't know if I can say this out loud or not, but, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we there are plans for a separate building, but still on the Shepherd's Seminary campus. So, you know, we promote ourselves as local church oriented, and uh, you were right there in the local church when you're studying and and so forth. So that is probably one of uh, the good points that we have for the Shepherd yeah. Seminary. Awesome. Well, we want to thank you again for appearing with us. And the publisher, Crest Biblical Resources, has promised to send us a um, a blurb where somebody can click on it and they'll get a 20% discount on the book. Go so ahead. we'll add that to our website when it comes. But we want to uh, really appreciate your visiting with us and sharing. And is there anything that you'd like to um, share with our audience as to future works that you might be doing or some, where they can find any of your um, pertinent information on a website? Yeah. Um, yeah, the New Covenant Ministry of the Holy Spirit, that's 
pretty good book. That's been I Cresp uh no um oh who was it? It was published by one of the main, one of the evangelical presses to start out with, and then Crest picked it up when it went out of print out of print. All right, now I'm working on the cosmic war and the coming day of the Lord. So I've um, got about 350 pages written, and we'll see where that goes. But that's uh, been a, where my, all my energies has been spent mm. recently. Yeah. Well, thank you again for joining us. Mike Stallard, we had him on a couple of weeks yeah, ago. He said to say hello to you. Yeah, he is, he's a, he did such a good work there. on. Uh, it's in the book there about how he sets up uh, mm. dispensational how they get from the Bible to theology. Such a good, good, good article. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Larry. We certainly appreciate it. Okay. So my um, pleasure. Thank you. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button and hit the notification bell so you can get more of these uh, if you so desire. Thank you again for watching us and we'll sign off here. God bless you. Thank you. See you next time. See you next time. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Book Podcast. If you liked what you heard and want to support us, like, follow, subscribe on any podcasting platform, on YouTube, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Simply type in at Hear the Book Pod, at Hear the Book Pod. Thank you. See you next time.